So I'm going to talk to you today about climate change. And I want to start with one picture. And I'm going to guess that you've probably seen pictures like this before. What it shows is the global surface temperature of the Earth as it's changed in the last 150 years. And the main thing you need to know about it is that it's going up. And this means that the Earth is warming. And a few other facts we need to get out of the way are that humans are responsible for at least a good fraction of this because we emit uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And that even if we stop emitting those greenhouse gases today, the climate's going to keep warming for a while. There's some more warming that we're in for no matter what, just because it takes a while to, to happen. But we're not stopping emitting them because our whole economy runs on, on fossil fuels still. And so if we keep accelerating the, keep emitting fossil fuels and accelerating them even faster as we've been doing over recent decades, then we're going to see even more warming. And this is going to have serious consequences for the planet. Now, I'm going to now assume that we all know this and understand these uh, facts. But what you may not understand is why I'm standing here at an event about Broadway talking about climate change. <laughs> so the first answer is that uh, I'm actually not going to say much more about the science of climate change. I'm really here to talk about climate change as a communication problem and as an, uh, how we understand climate change in the way that we need to and how that's related ultimately to a storytelling problem. But the other reason, of course, is that Broadway is in New York City. And New York City, of course, is located here in planet Earth like everywhere else, in the upper right <laughs> quadrant there. And so, um, so just like everywhere else on, on the planet, we are exposed to the natural environment. We, we are vulnerable to it. And even though some of us who live here uh, full time think that the map of the world looks like this sometimes. <laughs> this is a, a subway map of New York, for those watching at home who have, may have never seen it. Uh, even, if you, even if you think this is the map of the world, as I sometimes do, I'm, I'm from here as well, there are times when it becomes uh, impossible to maintain that illusion. There are times when, uh, when we experience Mother Nature reasserting herself in our, in our environment. And um, the times when that happens most acutely are extreme events, extreme weather events. Extreme weather events are the leading edge of climate. They're what we feel most sensitively. And understanding something about extreme weather events can help us to understanding something about why it's difficult to do what we need to do about climate change. So by way of making that point, I want to illustrate that with a little discussion of one particular extreme weather event that anyone who has been here a couple of years ago will remember, and that's Hurricane Sandy. When Hurricane Sandy happened in New York City, it, uh, the infrastructure failed catastrophically. The subways flooded, the road tunnels flooded, power went out for a large fraction of the city, and many neighborhoods were essentially destroyed. And the question that uh, many asked is, why did this happen? Did we, why did we build the city in such a way that one storm could do so much damage? Did we not know that it could happen? And the answer is, we really did know that it could happen, those of us who, you know, who study these things and pay attention. And uh, because we understand that this, again, this city is built as, on planet Earth with the same you know, with a geography that inherited from the land that was there before the city. And so instead of the subway map, this is another map of the city that shows what happened during Sandy. It uh, only shows uh, New York. The, and it shows what areas flooded. Anywhere, everywhere that's blue is a place that flooded during Hurricane Sandy. And the, those regions are all historically either wetlands or barrier island, as in the case of the Rockaways, or landfill which means they're all places that are naturally low to the water and naturally close to being flooded anyway. And so if you were to ask somebody before Sandy had happened who, who knew about storms and about the city, where, what will be flooded in a hurricane? This is, these are the places that we would have told you would be flooded. And, but of course, you know, real estate's expensive here. Everything gets developed, and so we build there anyway. But um, if we really you know, understood the risks, maybe we wouldn't have. The classic. Uh, one classic case of that is here. This is South Street Seaport. Uh, streets flooded during South Street Seaport in Sandy. And in South Street Seaport, the water came up to about a couple blocks in from the East River up to a street called Water Street. And it's called Water Street because that's where the coast used to be before the Dutch and English built landfill out from it. So no surprise that that's where the water came back to. Now, <laughs> the poster child for our being unprepared 
uh, when we should have been prepared was this, uh, this picture. This is the South Ferry Station, the new South Ferry Station, which opened just a little while before Sandy happened. The South Ferry is down at the southern end of Manhattan. It's where you get on the Staten Island Ferry, the end of the number one subway line. And um, you could say, I mean, about the subway system flooding, you could say, well, the subway system was built 100 years ago. So who knew anything about hurricanes or sea level rise then? Who, who knew what we were in for? But this was built just before Sandy, so we certainly did know. And um, to illustrate, and by the way, the cost of building this was about uh, half a billion dollars, and the cost of repairing it is about half a billion dollars. So the subway station was totaled, the total loss, and it was built in a flood zone, what we knew was a flood zone. And this is evidence that we knew. This is um, a report, a figure from a report written by the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, and the Weather Service and some local transit agencies in 1995 about um, the city infrastructure. And, and to write this report, they did some estimates of how high the water could possibly get. And um, a, in, in a big storm, they estimated the storm surge with computer models and drew lines of where the water would get to in critical transit facilities. And that's the, you see the high water line there. This is the old South Ferry Station, which is literally a stone's throw across the plaza from the new one in the same flood zone. So we certainly did know, and the station got built anyway. And the question, you may ask is why, why do we, if we know that there's a risk from the environment, science tells us why don't we prepare better for it? And the answer, this is really not a particular failing of New York City. This is not a criticism of, of our uh, city or state or region. This is human nature. The psychologists tell us that human beings have two ways of thinking. We have one way of thinking that is uh, instinct. If there's something that we've, has happened to us many times and that we're familiar with, then we know how to react instinctively and we don't really have to think and we're good at that. But if a scientist tells us something's gonna happen far in the future sometime, we don't know exactly when, and we've never experienced that thing, then even if we believe the scientist and we think that they're credible, it's very difficult for us as humans to use numbers and statistics to make investments ahead of time. And uh, this is a problem when it comes to climate change because climate change is also something that seems far off in the future and that's outside our experience, but that we would really do well to make investments in ahead of time because if we could reduce our carbon emissions now, we can reduce the warming that we're gonna feel. But once we emit it, it's there for a very long time. It's very difficult to take it out. So the typical pattern of reacting after the worst has happened is really not gonna serve us well in this instance. And just to show that climate change is outside our experience, that's what makes it, that's what makes it difficult. We can't, we can't react instinctively because our instinct doesn't serve us and we haven't experienced. This is one statistic, the last number I'm gonna show you, and it's the, a projection from the New York City Panel on Climate Change, which is a group of scientists that work with the city to project, project what's gonna happen. And the projection is that by the 2050s, the number of days in a typical year in New York City that are over 90 Fahrenheit is gonna be more than double what it is now. Um, so that's just to say the summers are gonna be hotter than ever we've ever experienced. That's just one measure, sea level rise and other things are serious, but, uh, but this is to say it's gonna be outside our experience. So this is really um, not just a problem of this problem of understanding something far in the future, this is a storytelling problem as well. The same reason that it's hard to uh, visualize these problems and take action is a problem, it, because it's far in the future, this is the same reason it's hard to tell the story of climate change. Some of you might have seen this movie, The Day After Tomorrow. This movie was based loosely on a, a real scientific scenario. Of course, it was exaggerated and everything. But it, the idea that there could be a sudden uh, freeze of the Earth is based on some real science, loosely. What was really unrealistic was that they took <laughs> something that, the, in, if it were to really happen, would take decades or centuries or longer, and they made it happen in three days, and there, or something like, it was a few days. The reason they did that was because it's a movie, and you have to have character development and plot and all that stuff. If it takes <laughs> decades to happen, then you know, it's too long for the movie. So we need to come up with new ways to tell the story that are faithful to this, a little more faithful to the science so that people can connect the story to what's really gonna happen. And I'm gonna just give, briefly give you my story. I'm, like many um, scientists, I'm a comic book nerd, so I think a good climate change movie would be to have Storm from the X-Men. She's a, She's a superhero who controls the weather. So I think it would be good if she could fight global warming. There would have to be some bad guys involved somehow, but whoever makes the movie can figure that out. And since this is science fiction and comic books, the way to solve the problem that climate change takes a long time is time travel. And that way, the climate change can be realistic and take the right amount of time, and everything else can be unrealistic, and that's <laughs> fine. But that's just, thank you. Marvel Comics can have that for free. That's, uh, that's on me. Um, so, but that's just my story. So, 
I know there's a lot of people involved here professionally in the telling of stories, and I just want to encourage you to think about, both as citizens, what do we do in order to understand the changes that are coming in a way that enables us to take the actions that we need to take. And that means both getting prepared for the climate change that there's no way out of, we're going to have sea level rise and heat and everything in New York City and many other places, and also as storytellers to think of ways to communicate this story in a way that'll be more effective and make people understand really uh, what's coming. So that's my, my request and my challenge to the creative class, and I ask you just to start spreading the news. Thank you. Thank you.